as I pondered the readings this week, I'm sitting there looking at it again and thinking, okay, we have Luke's account, because we believe that the author of Acts and Luke are the same person. We have Luke's account that Jesus ascended from Jerusalem. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem, there is on the Mount of Olives the ruins of a church that was built to celebrate the ascension. But then we have Mark, which is older than Luke and Acts, that says he ascended into Galilee. If you remember on Holy Saturday night, we heard that in Mark's account of the resurrection, that Jesus told the women to go and tell his brothers that he was ascending to the Father from Galilee. He would meet them there. And this is the continuation of that passage that we heard. Oh, Galilee. Well, I looked at Matthew, and Matthew said he ascended from Galilee. Hmm. And the last account in John's gospel, there is no real ascension in John's gospel, but John has the last appearance of Jesus on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So where did it happen? Not quite sure. But I, I pondered this all this week, you know, and I, I kind of thought about it, and I thought, well, you know what? I, I don't think for Luke it mattered. If you kind of look at Luke's theology of how he put his gospel together, he arranged it in this wonderful geographical pattern so that it begins in Galilee, and Jesus works his way down through Samaria and then down to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He suffers, dies, rises, the Holy Spirit descends on Pentecost after the ascension, and it all explodes from there. It's like a skyrocket, except it goes down instead of up. But it's this wonderful pattern that Luke gives us between Luke, the gospel, and Acts. And the pivotal point is the ascension. But, you know, it makes sense that he would have gone back to Galilee because I really think that as soon as the Passover was over, that Passover where Jesus was put to death, the disciples got out of town as soon as they could. You know, they were in fear of their own life. They were afraid that the ones who had put Jesus to death by crucifixion, that they would come after them as well. And so they went back to Galilee. Besides that, they had jobs. They had families to take care of. They had things to do. You know, and I don't think they quite understood all that was going on. I think that during that time between the resurrection and Pentecost, they spent a lot of time together in their free time talking about what they had experienced and even experiencing the presence of the risen Lord as the Gospels tell us until he was taken up to heaven. You know, and, and it's, I love Luke's account of that. They just stand there, you know? We all know that kind of dumb look that comes when you don't know what to make of what's happening. And then we have the two angels appearing saying, guys, get a grip. <laughs> Do what he told you. You know, I, I don't think it was quite as dramatic as in Mark's gospel where, you know, Jesus ascends and they get going. I, I really think that it took them a little time to figure all this out. You know, for the Holy Spirit to work in their lives to help them understand what it was that the Lord wanted them to do it, do and how to do it. And, and that, I think, is important because I think it says something about our lives as well. You know, oftentimes we have this idea that, you know, people who are inspired by the Holy Spirit have God come and, Charlie, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> you know, they think that that's the way it works. And I got to tell you, it ain't. It ain't. There are maybe a few people who have that real powerful sense in their lives, but most of the time, it doesn't work like that. It is this nagging thought that keeps coming again and again, oftentimes to the mouths of others, that kind of provides direction for us. The Holy Spirit is much more subtle. You know, we keep thinking it's a push when it's a gentle nudging. That's the way the Spirit works in our lives. That's why I love St. Paul's line in the Gospel about opening the eyes of our heart, letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us to wherever it is 
that the Lord wants us to go. And I think that's what happened in the lives of these men and women who experienced the power of Christ and his resurrection and thought, how do I share this with others? How can I give this to others in a way that will help them share in what I know? And I, I think there was great power in the way they did that. I think they learned to do that. But again, it was not something magical or sudden. It was something that evolved in them as they came to understand. You know, the disciples probably went back up to Galilee, I think, and this is just my opinion, <laughs> whatever that's worth. But, you know, they went back to Galilee, and then they would have come down again because Pentecost, as we know it, is in the Hebrew, Shavuot. And it was another pilgrim festival, and they had to come down from Galilee to Jerusalem. And so they would have come back together. And I, I suspect they were in that upper room again. They, you know, they had formed this community around the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. And they were figuring out what that all meant. And they were in that upper room. They had come down and they stayed together because they were supported by one another and encouraged by one another and learning the truth through one another. And then the Holy Spirit comes down like a strong driving wind. I'll talk about that next week. But, you know, I, I think that when people say, well, okay, Matthew says this and Mark says that and Luke says that, which is right, I think they both are. They're telling us insight into the story of Jesus, the mystery of Christ's resurrection that goes far beyond words. But the most important thing about it is that we're in call to listen to the Holy Spirit to lead us wherever it is the Lord wants to take us. You know, and I think that's an important thing. This last week, besides trying to figure out the differences between these two ascension points, what struck me was, you know, who were the people in my life that spoke, that encouraged me and enabled me to get to where I am today. You know, because I really think that the Lord has called me to live the life that, that I am living. It isn't so much something that I've chosen, but I think God called me to this. As I think anyone who finds a level of contentment and peace and happiness in their life are doing exactly what God called them to do. Because they've listened along the way and they followed that because you know, I remember my mom at one point before I was ordained was concerned that maybe she had been an undue influence on my life to choose priesthood. And I told her no. But, you know, her concern was is that I, I would be unhappy. And I said, Mom, God doesn't call you to a life of unhappiness. He doesn't promise it'll be easy. But whatever it is that God calls us to, whatever that life may be, will be one of peace and contentment. Not ease, but when we're doing what the Lord wants, there'll be a peacefulness about it. We'll know that because the Holy Spirit will lead us there. In fact, I, I look back at my life and I think how much my mother did influence me in many ways. You know, when I was a kid preparing for First Communion and Confirmation in second and fourth grade, I can remember her like she did with my brother and sisters, you know, would sit, and those of us who are a little older will remember that you had to remember catechism questions, you know? Who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? God made me to love and love and serve him this morning, but I had it with him in the next. You know, you'll learn those questions and answers, and my mom would drill me on those in preparation for those sacraments. You know, she would sit there with flashcards when I was struggling with math or help me with spelling tests. She did that with my sisters and brother, too. You know, she would take that time with us, even though there was so much going on, to influence us to learn and to grow. And then in the years that I was in the seminary, you know, those were the days that you didn't have cell phones or texts or email. You had this thing called snail mail. And every week there was a letter from my mother just filling me in on what the heck was going on with the rest of them at home, giving me their bowling scores, how my brother did at basketball practice, all the kind of stuff that was going on. 
But somehow, every couple of years, she always seemed to sense from my letters back home times that I was struggling with the direction of my life. And I still have a couple of those letters where she would just say, David, you need to understand that your father and I will be proud of you no matter what you do. Don't ever think you have to do anything for us. Even if it's a decision to dig ditches for your life, if you think that that's what God is calling you to do, we'll be proud of you. You know, And it was that kind of freedom that enabled me to keep making the choice over and over again. In fact, my parents never said anything of encouragement about my being in the seminary until the day I was ordained a deacon when I asked for their blessing. And they finally told me directly that they were proud of me. And of course, they had my blessing. I had their blessing. No, they were very careful about making sure that, you know, whatever it is that God is calling you to, do that. And I think, my sisters and brothers, that's really what this is about. You and I live in the church today. You and I are called to be the disciples of the Lord Jesus, to walk in this life. We have inherited all that has been handed on to us, as St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesians. We are to live a life in a way that proclaims the good news of Christ, crucified and risen. To do that in a way that's inspired by the Spirit of God. That we are to listen with the eyes of our heart to what it is the Lord is asking of us, to seek what it is that the Lord calls us to, and to respond faithfully to that. And in that, we will come to know the joy that only Christ can give. You know, I, I think of those guys, those men and women, who are standing there looking up at the sky, <coughs> saying, now what? You know, where did he go? And it doesn't matter. That's not the question. The question is, where does God want us to go? Where is the Lord sending us? And will we allow the Lord to speak to us, to slowly reveal where it is he wants us to go, and he will give us the words and the strength and the power to do whatever it is that he asks? It's not so much about looking up. It's about looking out.